panorama. We've had the wettest start to the summer for over 240 years, and we're being warned that from now on we should expect the unexpected. Every time it rains, I'll be at the window waiting to make sure the brook hasn't breached the banks again. And to be honest, if I could just go somewhere else, I would go. The recent floods have cost 14 lives and left over half a million people either homeless or without power or safe drinking water. The likely cost to the country, £6 billion. I believe it's a criminal act to be actually um, allowing people to buy houses here knowing that there's a potential to flood. So are we going to repeat the mistakes of the past or grip this thing once and for all? The government is urgently reviewing the impact of the floods on our essential services, schools and hospitals, and our power and water supplies. More than a million of us live in homes which are at risk of serious flooding. So, if there's more wild weather on the way, what can we do to flood-proof Britain? And can we afford it? To try to find some answers, I'm going to follow the flow of the most recent floods and the trail of devastation they left behind. Well, this is where our journey begins, the source of the River Severn, high in the Cambrian Hills in mid Wales. The rain that falls here flows some 200 miles down to the sea. During the storms, the swollen river that it became brought misery to more than 100 towns and villages along its route. We will follow the full course of Britain's longest river to find out what we should be doing to prevent disaster the next time the rains come. And they will. Remember when an extraordinary weather event was an early spring or an Indian summer. very clear changes that are happening to the climate. Heat waves, droughts and heavy rainfall events, floods are the chief changes that we would expect to see. The extreme storms might well become more extreme. On Thursday the 19th of July, the Welsh hills were already sodden from days of heavy rain. A Met Office warning was issued reporting high altitude winds and a heat wave over Europe was about to funnel a powerful storm towards the west of England. The storm would put the river into flood. By the time it hit Shrewsbury, the river was six times higher than normal. It came as no surprise to a town that had already been engulfed three times in a decade. After the floods in 2000, Tony Blair headed for the Severn to make a promise his successor is now under pressure to match on a much wider scale. Frankly, we're going to have to do more uh, because these are the worst floods since 1947, but they are only two years after previously very bad floods. And talking certainly to the emergency service people here, they uh, reckon that it's perfectly possible they'll be having to cope with this type of problem again in the next few years. Too right. Walls were then built along a part of the river, and in 2003, portable barriers arrived. The first big test came three years later when the flood defences successfully held back the Severn. They worked again in this summer's flood. But the wall and barriers come at a price and a stark lesson in the economics of flood defence. It protects some 74 properties and that was the basis of the original scheme. And at a cost of? It's about £6 million. Which sounds like an awful lot of money, so would it be cost effective to roll this sort of flood protection system out along the rest of the Severn? The Severn is a massive river with wide floodplains. Um, it won't be possible to defend every community and certainly would not necessarily be cost beneficial either. So what should we be doing? We've got to learn to live with the floods and uh, to look to ensure that we don't further develop in the floodplains and uh, put more people and property at risk. Much better, says the Environment Agency, to leave floodplains as 
natural sponges to soak up the swollen waters. But as I drifted down the now gentle river, I could see it isn't getting its way. The pressure to house people and the attraction of waterside living is just too strong. We've been squeezed right into the banks of the river, very, very close. And you can see the height of the, the front the control banks that we had to build in order to do that. Well, we've and just got a new property, yeah, new development yeah, here, for example. Situation. But they've Look already how built. Close it is. Okay, so they're close to the river, but they have built a wall. Yeah, is yeah. that sufficient to protect that, them? That will deal with one of the issues. By building on the floodplain, you are at risk. They're protecting that immediate risk by producing a very large, effective flood barrier. The problem then is that's actually squeezing the river itself into this narrow corridor, which is not a natural situation for the river. It pushes the water into a small area. It increases the velocity, the power, the damage. It moves water downstream incredibly quickly. It means that anybody downstream is going to get a dog of water very sudden, very powerful. So with no escape, the water is channeled towards the underprotected neighbours. A golden opportunity to restore the natural balance of the river in Shrewsbury has been lost. The town's football stadium has occupied this prime plot of land for almost a century, but now the club has moved and the site is being turned into a £50 million housing development. What did you have to do? We looked at the, the problems on um, the river and the flooding. The argument against building on floodplains are not new. We've had governments from the 1920s saying it was folly to build on floodplains. The Environment Agency still believes it's folly. There are other developers who say the same. What's your response to those who feel that we should be setting aside this land as a critical natural asset in times of flooding? The answer simply is there are some sites too valuable not to build on and, and too involved into the community to turn around and suggest they can just be left fallow. The Environment Agency objected to the plans because of the site's history of flooding, but the local authority went ahead anyway. There was a compromise. The developer agreed not to build on the land closest to the river and put half a million pounds towards a local flood defence scheme. That will protect the new homes and houses nearby. The developer says without his cash, that important scheme would never have gone ahead. We had to um, make the payment here because we didn't make the payment. Uh, it would never have happened. There was no government money available to make this happen. It was all down to us to turn around and sit down with them and say, look, let's work together. And I think the trouble is the government talk very well, don't always deliver. And I'm not just talking about this government, I think it's successive governments as well. That's left the Environment Agency playing without a full deck of cards. But what we're trying to do now is to minimise the impact, even though our advice has been ignored about developing the site in the first place. Does that not frustrate you? that you're now having to work with instead of really it not happening at all? It's all part of the process to protect people and property. That's a very government agency line, might I say. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, but if there's, there's more than one way. Uh, if you're a poker player, there's often you keep on playing hands until you, you get the win that you want. But how many hands are they winning? This scheme might represent a sensible compromise, but elsewhere the Environment Agency has lost the argument on 10 major developments where it believed life and property could be at risk. Despite the Environment Agency being the government's expert, it seems the planning authorities and Whitehall think they know best. I've stood in the middle of South Yorkshire, I've seen it. I've stood in the middle of Worcestershire, I've seen it. Um, I'm sure 10 years ago they would have said it was all safe and secure. After the last floods, we've heard you know, that they uh, gave assurances. The assurances are worthless. Climate change is changing the basic rules of engagement. That change may already be evident. Downriver at Worcester, the flood water peaked 15 feet above normal summer levels. That was a disaster for farmers who lost valuable crops at the height of the growing season. This is Worcestershire, the Vale of Evesham. The land here is rich and fertile. Agriculture is crucial to the area. But is the way we're farming intensively and on the floodplains also contributing to the problems brought by the floods?
experts and farmers have different views on that. During times of flood, some farmers allow their land to be inundated. This absorbs water that would otherwise surge downstream. They feel they should be compensated for that. We have spring onions that were destined for the supermarkets, but they are totally scrapped. That's 100% loss. 100%. How much? What's the, what's the price on that? The total loss to this particular uh, farm is about a quarter of a million pounds. Farmers can't insure unharvested crops. The cost to the industry in the Seven Valley alone will run into tens of millions of pounds. Compensation or not, will pay the price through higher grocery bills. While farmers are victims of floods, the way the land is farmed is having an effect on the flow of the river. Well, basically, the last 50 years has been a huge uh, intensification of the way that we farm the land. So we've seen marshes and wetlands turn to pasture, pasture turn to arable, and at each stage you need more and more drainage. To convert to arable, you have to drop the water below the level of the roots so the plants can grow, otherwise they die. So you need drains, you need to have the water off, particularly in the summer. And the consequence of that drainage is that water runs off the land incredibly quickly. That means it goes back into the river system and moves downstream incredibly fast. So, channelled by urban development and joined by the runoff from farming land, water rushes downstream to a place with an unenviable title. The most flooded town in England. Population, 2,600. You'd think that if there was anywhere that should have adequate flood protection, it's Upton. Instead, it has to rely on temporary barriers. This time, they didn't arrive. Given the force of the flood, traders accept they probably would have flooded anyway, but it's becoming impossible to do business here. We took the pub over in 2000, and, and as I'm sure everyone remembers, we had the horrendous floods in 2000. Um, we, we made a big claim then, and, and the insurance company the next year would only give us insurance with a £25,000 excess on flooding. And then the following year, we couldn't even get flood insurance. And, and it's only this last year coming up where we've actually got flood insurance again, so we, we're just so lucky. What did they say to you then last time around when you couldn't get? What was the reasons they gave? The, the, well, the, 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 what they actually said was, we don't insure against inevitable. Yet Upton doesn't qualify for the defences we saw up at Shrewsbury. The Environment Agency has a point system, and little Upton just doesn't have enough. So everyone gets wet. We've just literally got down here and it was this deep and it's come up about half a metre since we've been down here, about an hour, half an hour. Just come up, you can't even walk through it now. If we have another year like this, this is now the sixth flooding incident we've had in eight months, then I can't see how businesses, not just, not just on the riverside here, but how businesses in Upton generally will be able to survive because it, we, we, we sort of rely on our tourist trade here. This is July, everyone keeps forgetting, this is July, and, and look at us, we're, we're now in, in flood, it's, it's awful. Unless the point system is changed, could Upton, or at least part of it, be our first community to be surrendered to the elements? This becomes the norm, then I could see Upton turn into a ghost town. It, it's, it, it won't be able to survive. We can't keep being cut off like this. But they will. Despite this flood, Upton won't get permanent defences. And what about bigger towns like Tewkesbury, just seven miles downstream? It's at the confluence of the Severn and Avon, which also flooded. Despite being so vulnerable, its only defence against flooding are its water meadows. And that means Tewkesbury marks the limit of what's possible with flood defence. We've lived up here for over 40 years and we've never, ever had anything like this. Oh, wow. The best way to assess just how vulnerable this community is is from the tower of its famous abbey, built on high ground in the centre of the town. For Ian Clucky, an expert in hydrology, this summer's floods have been a rude reminder of Tewkesbury's ancient past. I spoke to a resident of Tewkesbury a few nights ago who described her house flooded, no water supply, no electricity, and it was like living in the Dark Ages. 
can you realistically pay for effective flood defences for places like Tewkesbury? No. I think looking around this town, it's surrounded by rivers. It's a medieval town. The only way is to build a, the equivalent of a medieval wall around the entire town, which would look horrible, cost hundreds of millions of pounds. Hundreds of millions? Hundreds of millions of pounds, and uh, is not going to happen. If historic houses can't be defended, then essential 21st century utilities have to be. Just outside Tewkesbury, built right on the Severn, is the Mythe Water Treatment Plant. Essential services like these are meant to withstand a once-in-a-century flood, but in the early hours, two days into the flood, the works were overwhelmed. When I was last in Tewkesbury at the height of the floods, the water reached the top of that gauge, which just seems extraordinary now when you look at the water levels. But what's more extraordinary is that this vital water treatments plant wasn't better protected, and it's not the only example. There are nearly 3,000 water and power plants built on land at severe risk of flooding. Surely now something needs to change to better protect them. Given how strategic it is as a utility, as a water treatment plant, and how many people it serves in this region, would you say that was sufficiently defended? Um, I think the evidence is it wasn't because so much temporary work has had to be done in order to protect public water supply. So I think it points out uh, the problem of having uh, key bits of infrastructure on the floodplain um, which are not necessarily defended to the same levels as the rest of us are. With so many essential plants at risk, the utility companies are now being forced into some unwelcome calculations. The cost of better defences and infrastructure will be severe. And as customers, we've already been warned, it'll be us who'll have to fork out. Then there's the question of the nation's other flood defences against rivers and the sea, maintained by the Environment Agency. There is going to be an enormous bill. At the end of the day, you and I are going to pay it. Um, hopefully not just you and I, but the reality is we're looking at about um, a billion pounds per year needed to continuously invest in infrastructure. A billion each year? A billion each year. And with climate change bearing down on us, or probably we're in it, um, we have to put more investment in order to stand still. The glimpse of the future without that kind of investment came 12 miles downstream from Tewkesbury. During the peak of the flood, more than three billion litres of water were pouring through Gloucester every hour. Just outside the city, another crisis for another of our essential utilities was unfolding. Half a million people almost lost power when the water reached Gloucester's major electricity substation. Images that must have brought a chill to those responsible for keeping the country running in times of emergency. But how did it come to that? It's very difficult to predict in what particular area uh, the rainfall is going to have the biggest impact. And when an electricity station or a water station is under threat, people have got to act very quickly. In the sixth richest country in the world, families were reduced to queuing for water. How many of us knew just how fragile our infrastructure is? The military called in. And police on the streets keeping order. Officials worked relentlessly, helped by being able to use the portable flood barriers, which hadn't reached Upton. The waters were held at bay, just. I would say within six inches of uh, 500,000 houses being out of electricity. A shock to the system in every sense of the word. Perhaps, though, a welcome one. Are there too many bodies responsible for too many elements of our utilities, infrastructure and flood defence? There'll be a government inquiry, of course, and those who work in flooding full-time, and not just when it's newsworthy, hope a new single authority will emerge. That's what's lacking at the moment. It's a direct result of the privatisation of all the basic utilities and the gaps between local authorities, the gaps that exist between them and uh, water companies, off what driving their spending policy, the environment agent doing strategic floods, uh, all of these little bits, um, they're not joining up properly, so that has to get sorted, and only the politicians can do that. So the inquiry really ought to focus on that. What went wrong with the system? 
um, at the moment? What can we learn from it in order to survive climate change, which is coming uh, bearing down on us at a rate of knots? Otherwise, otherwise we're living with floods, and we learn to swim better. Swimming lessons would have come in handy at Long Levens on the edge of Gloucester. The residents on this new estate bought their homes, thinking they were moving into a beautiful location by Gentle Brook. They say they had no idea they were actually living on a floodplain. I moved here about just over four years ago. There was no mention of us being on a floodplain at all. It was basically a nice family house on a nice estate in Long Levens. No, no knowledge of it flooding, and the same with ever, all the other residents. We've all appointed independent solicitors to sort our mortgages out, and not one person was led to believe that we were on a floodplain of any risk at all. This house was the show house. It was the last house on the estate to be bought, um, and it certainly didn't have anything in the sales prospectus that there was, it was on a floodplain. Conveyancing solicitors may provide information about flood risks, but they're not obliged to. So it's a case of buyer beware. Some of the residents don't expect to be back in their homes until next year. Better information for home buyers and a more transparent insurance system has to be a priority for any new flood authority. This here where I'm stood is my kitchen door. <laughs> well, where's my kitchen door? Um, along here were the cabinets and my cooker and I had war units up here, um, fridge freezer, obviously all the washing machine and appliances were here, kitchen table, big cupboard under the stairs and it's all just been ripped out, it's just gone in a skip. After being flooded twice in a month, the estate is now a high risk area for insurers. The repairs to Leah's house will cost around £20,000. Her insurers have said they'll cover her this time, but they've warned her premiums will go up. I could be looking at 50, 60, 100 pounds a month, and I just don't have that sort of money to spend, spend out each month. People have quoted excess figures of thousands, and if that's the case, I, is it even going to be worth me getting insurance if my excess is going to be thousands of pounds? Because I won't have that either. The people I've met along my journey have said they're fed up with politicians who turn up in the aftermath, making promises and then moving on. Given the government's intention to build hundreds of thousands of new homes on floodplains in the next 12 years, where is the reassurance that those homes will be properly protected and covered by insurance in the long term? If in the future the insurers say we are not going to continue to underwrite these sorts of properties, will the government underwrite the insurance for those people who are otherwise living in worthless properties? Well, that's a very, it's a very difficult question uh, for governments. Look, we're going to have to look at how we're going to work our way through this problem. America does it. They have a government-backed insurance. Uh, well, they do. Um, and we'll have to think about what to do in those circumstances. But up until now, what we have been able to do with the insurance industry is to have an agreement that we will invest more in flood defence. That's what we've done and that is what we're doing. And in return, the insurance industry has said that they will make uh, flood insurance available to the vast majority of properties in the country. But not all of them, Mr Ben. Hello. We rang 10 companies about getting building and contents insurance in the worst affected Long Levens postcode. More than half of the firms said no. The industry is already signalling the government should spend more in keeping up its end of the bargain. I think unless we see the kind of investment that we need in flood defence, and I'm talking about the very long term, the next sort of 20 to 30 years, not next year or the year after that, uh, then we will see uh, the risk that Britain becomes like other countries where it's the taxpayer who has to bail people out rather than the private sector, rather than the insurance industry, and I would certainly regret that. I think the government needs to reflect on these recent events and increase the level of expenditure that it's proposing. But the government says it is spending more as a result of the recent floods. It's just announced an extra 200 million to add to the current 600 million the Environment Agency has to spend. Not the billion a year, though. 
that some say we need. We'll get the additional 200 million will be there by 2010 11. We're in the process of deciding exactly how we're going to phase it over the period of the next few years, but it's a sign of the government's clear commitment to invest more in flood defence. That's not enough for the Associated British Insurers, though. They say they need the money now. Well, the Association of British Insurers have said that we need to increase to £750 million. We're going to increase to £800 million. So I think that does show the government's commitment to invest more. But three years is a long time to wait for the Environment Agency. It already has a backlog of no less than 28 key flood defence schemes that will cost £122 million alone. And as our experts keep reminding us, the risk models we use need to be updated to take into consideration the rate of climate change. That's something the insurance industry is already responding to. Less than two weeks after the flooding, and already the flood map of Britain is being redrawn. It doesn't look to be any structural damage to the building, so it no. to be purely contents losses at this one. Okay. The model's going to be used by the insurance industry, and when they have a particular risk, they will run it through the model mm -hmm. and decide whether the, the model's worth insuring or not. Um, and on that basis, we'll either issue the insurance policy or not. It's so accurate, there'll be winners and losers, literally on the same street. If wild weather becomes more frequent, future generations could be looking at a very different landscape. There are two threats from flooding. One is from rivers and the other is from sea level rise. And that could actually be a bigger problem than the river flooding. And I believe it's the policy at the moment of the government that certain areas should be abandoned to the sea because it's not possible to build defences everywhere, at least, against rising sea levels. It's a dilemma that will, will run and run. Journey's end. The Bristol Channel, where the river meets the sea. Abandoning land to rising sea levels is something we've become resigned to. During my 220-mile trip following a river sent crazy by the rains, I've seen crops, businesses and homes ruined. Are we now going to have to accept that we can't afford to protect the land and everything we've built on it from the effects of the weather either? Every expert we've spoken to on this journey agrees. The risk models we use to assess and defend ourselves against these extreme weather events are out of date. We're under threat from the skies and the sea, and with climate change, these dramatic events are likely to become more frequent and severe. The cost will be monumental, and you can bet we'll all be paying the bill for decades to come. Kate Silverton reporting there. Now, you may well be wondering, those home information packs the government brought in came out this month. They must include, surely, information about flood risk? They don't. Next week on A Knife Edge, how inner city teenagers run the gauntlet of gang violence that's claimed 18 young lives this year in London alone. In the middle of life, the human body starts to need a little help to stay healthy and sometimes the battle is serious. Fight for Life next here on BBC One and on BBC Two on an emotional journey to find his family home, India, with Sanjeev Bhaskar. Tonight at 